Peace, love, and light, everyone. My name is Aliyah Oliver. I'm a Programs and Media Associate at the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, and we are an arts, culture, education, and media organization that advances cultural equity and racial and social justice for African descendant communities. On behalf of the center, I want to welcome you all to Sankofa Talks, a series of intergenerational talks between artists, activists, and educators of the African diaspora. Translated from the Twi language of the Akan people of Ghana, West Africa, Sankofa means to go back and get it. And it speaks to the importance of gathering up those lessons from our past and using them in the creation of our future. So for Black August, where we honor the work of our revolutionaries and educate ourselves on the histories of our resistance as a people, these Sankofa talks will highlight the culture bearers that continue in the work of our ancestors and agitate for our liberation as a people in all spheres of access, identity, and belonging. And in order to keep things interesting, CCC ADI has selected participants that have never met before. So not only is this the first time they're getting to know one another, but CCC ADI has also crafted questions for them to answer and to get to know one another. So without further ado, enjoy tonight's Sankofa talk, Navigating Activism as Black Women. Well, that was a powerful intro. Yeah, that was great. <clears throat> oh my, I didn't, who goes first? Well, I guess it's, it, it doesn't matter. Um, I can, I can go first. Uh, so hi everyone, really excited to be joining Rosa this evening to talk about an intergenerational conversation around activism and what it means to really create impact. And I will intro Rosa. We don't have a moderator this evening, so we are the moderators. So we're just gonna roll with it. So a little bit of information about Rosa. Rosa Clemente is a journalist, producer, political commentator, scholar, activist. A black Puerto Rican woman born and raised in Bronx, New York. She has dedicated her life to organizing scholarship and activism. From Cornell to prisons, Rosa is one of her generation's leading scholars on the issues of Afro-Latinx identity. She is a frequent guest on television, radio, and online media as her opinions on critical current events are widely sought after. Her groundbreaking article, Who is Black, published in 2001, was the catalyst for many discussions regarding Black political and cultural identity in the Latinx community. She is the creator of Puerto Rico on the Map, an independent, unapologetic, Afro-Latinx-centered media collective founded in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and Irma. For the last three years, she has served as a historical consultant to the Ryan Coogler, Macro, and Warner Brothers Judas and the Messiah, a movie inspired by the life of Fred Hampton, chairman of the Illinois Black Panther Party, who was assassinated in 1969. The movie will be released in 2021. Very interesting. She is the executive director of the Black Latino Organizing Project and hosts the web series. Disrupt the Chaos and is currently completing her PhD at the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Rosa was the first ever Black Puerto Rican woman to run for Vice President of the United States in 2008 on the Green Party ticket. She and her running mate, Cynthia McKinney, were to this date the only two women of color on a ticket. So I hope I did your bio justice, Rosa, and feel free if there was anything that I didn't say for you to insert. But clearly everyone, Rosa has an incredible, incredible history of this work, is still doing this work, uh, which I definitely wanna know how you aren't burnt out, how you keep yourself sane, because we know this work is not easy and um, just can't wait to really unpack a lot of that tonight. Yeah, thanks Chelsea. Um, no, that was good and we'll get more to stuff you know, as we talk, but um, Chelsea is a Columbia University graduate, public speaker, award-winning social entrepreneur, and has addressed thousands of people in speaking engagements that include Madison Square Garden, Yale University, and the National Action Network's annual convention. In 2016, she worked in the Obama White House as one of the youngest interns on criminal justice reform and urban economic opportunities. She is a co-founder and CEO of Women Everywhere Believe Incorporated, a national organization training women and girls of color to be civically and corporately engaged as well as becoming leaders. 
currently across eight states and 20 universities with a chapter in India, so internationally as well. It is recognized by elected officials and national organizations, unlike, um, um, excuse me, alike in the space of activism and social entrepreneurship. In 2019, Chelsea was named 30 under 30 at the Caribbean American Emerging Leaders, is a co-founder of Freedom March New York City, a youth protest and policy group on the front lines pushing for reform in New York. And everyone could go to a really good New York Times article where she and other younger people in her generation were profiled um, post the George Floyd um, murder and the protests and, and rebellions that took and took to the streets all over this country. So I hope I didn't leave anything out, Chelsea. No, you did great. We did great. We definitely <laughs> did a good job on introductions. Yeah. And I'm really excited because I know that this time, in a lot of ways, we've been getting questions about, you know, like, what does this moment mean? Or what does this movement mean? But a lot of what I talk about is you can't talk about this movement without talking about the work that has come before, without talking about the trauma that has come before, without talking about the oppression that's come before, and also the strides that we have made in this space of civil rights activism, um, thinking through things through an intersectional lens. So really excited to unpack. I don't know if we're getting to the question part or we have to wait for the question or an icebreaker okay cool what is the icebreaker <laughs> i'm the person that hates icebreakers and all this kind of stuff no not this us being together <laughs> it's it's okay. i know what you meant we know what you breakers. meant. <laughs> it says to share one thing that reminds you of where you're from oh my god i mean I'm from the Bronx, that's all. <laughs> like, I don't have to do like nine million things. I mean, but one thing that does always remind me of the Bronx is mm -hmm. Piraguas, which is shaved ice, if you don't know what that mm -hmm. is. Um, the Puerto Rican Day Parade, fire hydrants my dad used to turn on for the neighborhood, um, and my family, a lot of them still in the Bronx. So. I, love that. I love that. Okay, well, you're from the Bronx. I'm from Brooklyn, so you know the boroughs out here. Um, yeah. And I would say what reminds me of Brooklyn. So I actually grew up in Flatbush in Brooklyn. If anybody knows Flatbush, it is the Caribbean kind of like hub in Brooklyn where like everyone who's either like first generation American or like recently came to like New York, you know, a lot of them um, reside in Flatbush, particularly like um, the Jamaican community. So I would definitely say like Golden Crust. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny because Golden Crust is not what Caribbean people would go to. I for. eat it. I eat Golden Crust. <laughs> you know what's funny? The patty, like just grab the patty and go, you know, like. Oh. No, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I, I mean, my husband's from Flatbush, and that's where we met when I was living on um, Clarkson. Really? And, yeah. Oh, that's literally that's like right near yeah. me where I grew up. That's great. Yeah. So of course, Golden Crust, but we also have this spot on Finnamore and Flatbush that, unless you know, I don't even know what the name of it is. Um, I think they're still there. I hope they're still there. But yeah, I I spent yeah five years in in Flatbush, and that's where. I mean, my husband got pregnant with my daughter and did a lot of my organizing work. So um, yeah, Flatbush to me is yeah, Caribbean, but also like obviously Panamanian. And when we, when me and you say the Caribbean, it's like Dominicans and Puerto Ricans, yeah. but, but heavily Panamanian, right? Um, which is just a really dope and interesting mix, especially when you're taking the cue on morning on Prospect Park to get to this city. You just get to see like the diversity of our people absolutely. in like a couple blocks, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You're like bringing it all the way back. You're talking about the Q train. Yeah. <laughs> if you're yeah. not from Brooklyn or if you don't know Flatbush, based on this conversation, you've definitely received- Cause it's the best train. <laughs> you could get to the, to the city in five stops on the Q. You can, you can. Yeah. Now that's probably, did it because the MTA is such a hot mess, but you could legitly have gotten on the queue at Prospect Park and be in New York City in like 21 minutes. It's true. It's yeah. true. So good. Okay. Another icebreaker. Name your favorite way to decompress. 
So for me, and this may be like a very Gen Z thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I would definitely say Netflix. <laughs> My version of decompressing is like binge watching a Netflix show, relaxing. I also feel like just like based off of my work, I always need to be like on social, right? Like engaging, public speaking, things of that sort. So my best way of decompressing is like when I'm socially drained is to just watch Netflix. So so that's mine. That's mine too. I love, I oh, love yeah. television and movies, but I'm very about apocalyptic ones. So like- Me too. Yeah, The Walking Dead, of course. I um, love The Walking Dead. Fringe, which was an old, it's a lot of people didn't know about Fringe. It's like sci fi, but it was good. Um, yeah, but I'm definitely like a Netflix person. And for me, seeing so many people that I've been organizing with, like running shows or directing shows, or, yeah. you know, it's pretty dope. But I just got into this new show, it just premiered last week on HBO Max called Love Lovecraft Country Country. Mm. And um Journey Smollett is in it. And it's a um period piece of the kind of segregation gym uh segregation era. Mm -hmm. But it's like the first episode at the end is when all the sci-fi kicks in, like the vampires. And I was wait, like wait, 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 wait. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, Empire Lovecraft okay. Country. It's on HBO Max. I think when people first see it, they're like, "What?" And then at the end of the first episode, it's like, "Oh, finally getting to see like black folks outside the narrative of like police and white people killing and lynching us." But that's like an interesting name, Rosa, for the. I don't, yeah, I have to look more into that. But yes, Lovecraft Country. And I- I'm literally writing it down. I'm so into it. But yeah, I'm a total like um, a Snowpiercer, which I love the movie Snowpiercer, but the show had premiered recently in Davi Diggs, a, mm -hmm. a lot of people know him from Hamilton and other movies, is in it. And I'm like, I didn't think I would like it as much as I liked the movie. Yeah. Um, director of the movie was the same director of the movie Parasite, but I binged it in like two days and I was like, this is really dope around like deconstructing capitalism and who mm -hmm. matters and who doesn't. So yeah, I'm a TV pop culture fanatic for I sure. Love that. So then you love Game of Thrones. Of course. Okay. Okay. Good. I mean, I love Game of Thrones so much. Look, I made a fool of myself when I went to the Golden Globes um, in 2018, when Tarana Burke and Aijin and, mm -hmm. um, you know, but Tarana Burke called me and was like, we're going to the Golden Globes in a week. And when I was walking the red carpet, I was like, yo, where's Jon Snow? <laughs> <laughs> like, Kit, Kit Harrington is his name. And I didn't see him. And then I go, kept going out. My other sisters were like, I'm tired. I'm like, I'm not going to sleep, period. We're like, partying at the Golden Glows. And as I'm leaving the last party, he's there. And he goes, oh, you're the one about Puerto Rico. And I was like, can I have a picture with you? <laughs> it was like 3.30 morning, LA. He said no at first and he said, okay. And I was like, oh my God, Jon Snow. But Game of Thrones, absolutely. I love it. Love I it. Love it. <laughs> Don't you wish like, you know that that final season in Game of Thrones is too late for us to be spoilers, but you know the one where she's walking for a mile and she's being spit on, and everybody's saying shame, shame. Mm. Um, that's what ha should happen to all police officers that kill our people. They should have to do their own part while, while we throw stuff at them and say that's shame. <laughs> oh, well, that definitely transitions us into our Sankova talks. Um, critical conversations about everything that's that's happening. See, we can't even escape. That's the reality of being black in America, of being, you know, um, from a community of color in America and thinking through this lens. We can't even talk about Game of Thrones without connecting it to an issue that's happening right exactly. in the world. Um, so yeah, that's how we escape, but there's, there's a lot that we can't escape from. Name three things you are fighting for in your fight for black liberation. Ooh, I love this. Um, 
That's an interesting question. Um, when I think about three things specifically that I'm fighting for, do you want to take this one first, Rosa? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Rosa's like, no. <laughs> okay. So for me, I would say I'm fighting for Black youth future. And what I mean by that is as a 23-year-old who feels in a lot of ways that we are fighting the same fights that our ancestors and our grandparents, you know, have fought. I want to work in in my lifetime to see how we can change, you know, those conversations and those fights and and continue to of course build on on the work and the progress within this country um, so that our kids don't have to be fighting this fight 30, 50 years from now, right? Um, and then I would say my second thing that I'm fighting for is the sustainability of Black voices on the front lines who are doing this work, Black young people who are doing this work. Um, I think that this work is draining, it's tiring, and a lot of people um, are experiencing housing instability. A lot of people are experiencing um, job insecurity because we're in the middle of a pandemic, but also they are forfeiting you know, what it looks like to build a sustainable plan for themselves and putting first right, the people in the community in the work. And so how can I, through Freedom March NYC and other avenues, really amplify their voices um, and create spaces for like sustainable activism? And then the third thing that I definitely say that I'm fighting for is um, our country. I would say that I'm fighting for our country and a delayed promise because we know that we are living in a country that um, principles were really founded on life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, justice, equality for all. And yet those are some principles that we have not seen manifested within our lifetime. And truth be told, it hasn't been manifested in over 400 years. And so what does it look like to really hold our country accountable to that delayed promise um, and that intentionally delayed promise? And how can we as um, activists, how can we as organizers, and how can we as, as the future generations really make sure that we are pushing for and fighting for that promise so that more people, you know, can have opportunities and can have equity and justice and and we can hold the systems accountable who do not, you know, um, push forth that change. So that was a mouthful, but fighting for a lot. And I'm sure Rosa is going to, to take it away. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm fighting definitely for the future. Um, my daughter and my nieces and nephews and really all young people, mm -hmm. um, I'm fighting to end capitalism, to abolish police and mass incarceration, and to see our political prisoners free, as well as, you know, hoping, at least in my lifetime, that Puerto Rico will finally be independent um, and, and, and no longer a colony of the United States. Um, with that, you know, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? I mean, I. <laughs> It's so crazy because last night I was watching the Science Channel and an asteroid is actually going to pass this planet on Election Day. Mm -hmm. And I was like, right, it's literally going to pass on the day we try to remove a maniac from office or we're going to get hit by an asteroid. And I was like, well, that's pretty prophetic right there. So I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, right now, like you said, it, everything changes day by day like there's it's so hard to plan anything right now mm -hmm. you know um yeah it's it's just it's hard and our ancestors had it very hard i just don't know if they had a global pandemic except for the spanish flu in 1918 but you know i don't know what tomorrow's gonna look like i just know what's happening right now so but those are the things i i try to fight for and be more um um, focused on Absolutely. at this moment in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think that that's not lost on anyone. Let's see. Okay. Another one is woman. What does black liberation mean and look like to you? Um, black liberation to me looks like intersectionality. It looks like freedom in its truest form. I think that everyone should have the ability to navigate our society um, freely standing in their truth as long as it doesn't harm others and as long as it is a way right of, of continuing to build community and continuing to center the voices of those who are often marginalized within our communities and so 
for me, liberation is all encompassing. It's financial, it's educational. Um, it's within the criminal justice space, right? There, It's within um, the abuse to prison pipeline. It's within um, the school to prison pipeline. It's within our electoral politics. How do we think through ways of reimagining accountability, of reimagining um, centering the issues of those who are oftentimes marginalized? So it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, but I think that there's nothing wrong with understanding liberation to be nuanced, and there's nothing wrong with having short-term and long-term goals of what that looks like. And there's nothing wrong with continuing to redefine that based on new understandings and learnings as we as we navigate this world, because things are, are ever-changing. So that's my understanding of liberation. Um, I'll, I'll throw it over to you, Rosa. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's the same. I mean, what we many people have said lately is like, when Black people are free, we'll all be free. And that really means liberation from all the systemic things that we are facing and that is obviously changing in in these times but you know um i also think it's super important that people of african descent in this country really begin to unite over at least this goal of liberation um but also i'm very much about holding people accountable mm -hmm. um, which doesn't mean i can't be held accountable either. I, I mean, I think what it means for me is when I choose to do something, I literally look in the mirror and I ask, why am I doing this? And who am I doing this for? You know? Um, and I also think part of Black liberation is just at one point, not caring what white people think or do anymore. Like, I, I can't even spend my time. Like, unless I'm in a classroom teaching, you know, and in a multiracial space as a professor, like I am not the one for white people to be calling me about anything anymore, including some people in my family. I'm like, I don't have time for this. Like you could Google this and, and I don't have time to explain like why black people should be free at this point. Um, so I think for me that has become pretty critical in at least the last five years for me where I just am like, it's a wrap. I gotta worry about my people. Y'all gonna do what y'all gonna do. And I can't really worry too much about that unless we're out there fighting together against like white supremacy. So I think that's a big thing for me lately. Yeah. yeah. What's a misconception your generation has about mine and why do you think that is? Okay, what is a misconception, Rosa, that your generation has about mine and why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I think a misconception is that you are all not politically educated, conscious, or care about more than yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I am a public speaker, so up until now, I've been on the road for almost 10 years and always speaking at colleges or youth centers, um, community events with young people. So I have never been one to be like, oh, all young people are this, or all young people are whack, or young people don't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, because when I was your age, I had elders already like bringing me into the movement. So I think that is the biggest con misconception that you are all not engaged because of screens or social media. Uh, and I always see the opposite of that. I see that when younger people kind of get it, they just hit the ground running, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, so what do you think a misconception is about my generation? So my generation being, I guess we were what, Generation X, I don't know, I'm 48, whatever <laughs> demographic term for that or the hip hop generation. What's a misconception that your generation has about my generation. That's really interesting because I think that I definitely agree in a lot of ways that there may be misconceptions, but I don't necessarily feed into them. But I would say perhaps like a generational gap or divide, or I don't even know, in um, what it looks like to movement build. Uh, what does it look like? Like, I think one of the biggest things that have changed a lot, and correct me if I'm wrong, is around like respectability politics. You know, like we know during the first waves of the civil rights movement, right? Who were the leaders? How were they presented as? Um, you know, we know that before Rosa Parks sat on the bus, there was another young 
black woman who was go who was who was actually boycotting the bus and she became pregnant and because of that you know she was kind of erased out of the narrative and so i think in that same way as we think of like our generation now we're like more intersectional we're like more unapologetic and perhaps like less feeding into like these respectability politics like standards that have existed in previous generations um so i don't i don't know that's my thoughts on it respectability politics like that's maybe like the biggest generational difference but yeah i think the intersectionality piece is like critically important mm -hmm. uh, but having gone to college in the 90s you know we in the 90s um, because of also this kind of golden age of hip hop, as mm -hmm. well as a movement towards African centric education and, and especially in colleges, um, many of us were involved in our black student unions or Latino student unions. And in the nineties, we were told by a previous generation that you can't protest in that way, but we did. So for me, I'm fascinated because when I was in college in the 90s, we always used the word white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of stuff could have got you suspended or kicked out of a class, mm -hmm. just saying white supremacy. So now like, even hearing white people be like, yes, white supremacy is a pop, it's, it's really we weird in a good way. Um, but <clears throat> I'm born after 1969. So like our generation demographic, I think, the misconception was that we all went to college to get degrees to work like at a law for firm or a bank or whatever, and we didn't. And that um, actually black student unions and Latino student unions, especially in New York, at that time were probably at the highest peak in terms of what they did. So for us, when we shut stuff down, not only were we called wrong, and we had people telling us that we shouldn't do that, we also kind of faced sometimes expulsion. I almost got expelled as a junior in college for uh, doing the unrespectable thing of bringing in a speaker. Um, people know him as Stokely Carmichael. I knew him as Kwame Ture. Mm -hmm. And um, in the early 90s, especially in New York, we also had to fight against always be called anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. um, and to see your generation, um, that label be put upon, I, I, you know, I'm glad I went through it in the 90s when I was called anti-Semitic because there was no social media because now being labeled that literally destroys people's lives, right? And um, is also uh, people come after you. And I've seen two of my comrades, Linda Sassour and Mark Lamont Hill really feel the brunt of being called anti-Semitic and not only face death threats, but like a lot of things have been taken away from them. Um, knowing who they are, I, I know they're know that they have people's backs, but sometimes you feel super alone. And um, yeah, to be called that or labeled that to this day is it's it, it can kill everything, your activism, your career, and all of that. So I think there's a th that misconception that we haven't been fighting these fights before. We just didn't have social media, you know, because um, we've always generationally been fighting these fights that we talk about. But what I do like about this generation is that they're unapologetic, your generation, and that there's the intersectional, um, there is that intersectionality as a politic. Um, and I think for me, I see some of my, people in my age group just not getting it right and i'm like well then you're behind like if you're still being transphobic homophobic all of that you're not where young people are at and yeah. i think as a revolutionary i try to be that that you have to internally check and be like yo for mad years i never thought about disability rights i never thought about lgbtq people right like so what did I do to be complicit in, in erasing people? So I, I love that Dr. Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw gave us this and that your generation has taken it to a way better level of light 
these are the things we're no longer gonna accept from our internal communities. So if you're not down with that, then you're like behind the times. And unfortunately I've seen a lot of my folks in hip hop still be so stagnant that they're becoming pretty irrelevant right now politically. Like young people are not following them in any way, so. Very interesting. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think that like even thinking about Freedom March, right? Like from day one, we were really committed to being intersectional. We were really committed to making it a space that was inclusive to everyone, right? Like even when we're talking about like the history of Freedom Summer, like that dates back to 1964, where a thousand like young people came from the North to the South and organized in Mississippi voter registration jobs for black people trying to get them registered to vote. And it was a lot of white Jewish, right? Um, college students who went down there. When we're talking about just like the history of what we talk about when we say like oppression and systemic violence and systemic racism and all of the intersections of that on a global scale, I think that now um, and historically, right? Because I don't even want to negate the fact that historically there's always been these intersections and there's always been unity and there's always been attempts at trying to unify even when we talk about fred hampton and the rainbow coalition right like all of these things have always historically taken place and so we try to make sure that we focus on unity we try to make sure that we focus on the parts of history that also emphasize that unity and bringing communities together because i think that's when you're able to reach that common ground that's when you're able to build you know um strength, right? There's strength in numbers and there's strength in, in diversity. I mean, even being on the front lines, there have been so many moments where we look at the crowd and it's not just, you know, um, black people out there, it's white people too. It's non-black allies. It's everyone coming out and standing in solidarity. And so I just know that when I think about this country and when I think about the world and when our team thinks about the world, we think about it through the lens of equity and justice. We think about it through the lens of community and unity. One of the things that we say on the front lines all the time is like, this is what community looks like, right? This is what our country should look like. This is what it means when we talk about solidarity and allyship and standing together. It's all of the faces, all of the colors, all of the races, right? All of the ages um, coming together for this common ground. So all of the all of the um, religious, right? Like creeds and things of that sort. So it's it's been beautiful to see in the movement. It's been beautiful to really advance that type of um, message in the movement and also making sure that in the midst of all of that, we are we are centering as much as possible voices who need to be centered, right? So like black trans um, women thinking through how do we make sure they're incorporated into the conversations and how do we show up for them? And so there's a lot, there's a lot of nuances to, to movement work and, and it's, it's a lot and it requires a lot of strategy. It requires a lot of um, thinking outside of self and thinking about others. And I think that um, a lot of young people I, maybe because of just like how we've learned to navigate the world and like social media being such an incredible way of always seeing difference. Um, if you look for it, it's there, right? And even if you don't look for it, like you're always going to see it. And so I think for us really kind of like leaning into that difference as a strength um, and how we can kind of like pull on that. So yeah. And then I'll also say now that I'm thinking about it, another maybe critique that we get from our generation of just like in the movement is how decentralized things are. Like a lot of people complain about that, you know, like back in the day, there was like one leader, there was like a few leaders you can point out, whereas now it's like everyone um, is, I guess, not even necessarily everyone, but like they... And, and this is particularly for media, but like, you know, who exactly are you guys following? Where are you getting your messaging from? And it's like, no, like the power of the people is the fact that it is decentralized, is the fact that there isn't one sole leader, because in doing that, that's when we're able to consistently change, transform, adapt, and create impact in that way. So that's another, I think, maybe like generational difference, perhaps. But also, I feel like there's so many things that we do that are very much so similar to... Um, the civil rights movement and movements that have come before us. Yeah. Let's see, as black female activists in different generations, what about your work do you wish people knew more of? Oh, um, you know, for me, I, I'm kind of over that. I mean, I, I think we all go through a moment where we're like, you know, why am I not 
at this table, at this event, at this convention, in this book, and all of that. And I've gone through all of that, you know. Um, and, and for me, actually, last week was interesting because, or the week before, when Kamala Harris was picked, I had so many people hitting me up like, no, they keep saying she's the first Black woman or Black Asian woman you know, on a major party ticket. And I had to be like, no, she is on a major party ticket. The major parties, the Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. I I ran as a third party candidate, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I was like, doesn't this make you angry? And I'm like, no, not anymore. Like it made me angry for a long time. And then just um, right after uh, 45 was elected, I got to go through this great retreat with, really some powerful elders and and kind of i was just like you lot you gotta let that go um uh, you know because as a historian i know you know history doesn't lie it's not like we're not in the books it's not like you can't see what me and cynthia did in 2008 uh it, i think it was more people being angry for me, you know? And I'm like, I went through this in 2008 when all y'all were laughing at me. Now you want to like, you know, uplift the fact that I ran. So, you know, I, I think again, you know, being a historian, I'm always more, when I read anything, I think about who's not in the book. And then I go find out, you know, well, who was there and who was at this convention or who made that? And I think part of that is now there's high visibility in everything people do and that people mistake power with visibility and visibility with power, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and um, that's just not what I do anymore or, or what I worry about. You know, I'm like, if I want to tell my story, I could tell my story. I don't really have to wait for anybody to give me a deal or, you know, any space. And social media or the democratization of technology allows me for that. So mm -hmm. I kind of don't feel what the people knew more of. Yeah. I, I'm pretty open. You know, I, sometimes I'm like, people probably know too much of me anyway. Um, but that's how I've kind of always been pretty straightforward with anything in my life, um, especially publicly, because I know that I get my strength when somebody tells their story of something that I can connect to or that I'm going through. Uh, and I think that as Black women or, you know, African descendant women, like, I still think our narrative is just not truly told. Like, not everybody's visible. So who are all these other stories of women, black and brown women that we're not uplifting, right? Like working women and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, okay. So black, so what about your work you wish people knew more of? Um, I would definitely say that since these protests have emerged, a lot of people have done profiles on young organizers who've been um, leading the movement with the nonviolent protests. And I think that that's great and it's important. But I would also say that beyond just us as nonviolent protesters, we're also people with um, stories, with with the history, even before all of this, of especially those of us who've been doing social impact work for years. Like I've been doing public speaking, I've been doing um, social justice work, I've been doing work with women and girls of color. Before this pandemic, we were actually on tour um, for Women's History Month with different schools in the Department of Education doing leadership workshops for young girls, right? So. Before all of this, there there was more to it, and there was a passion for doing this work. And so, this work isn't a moment; it's a part of a long trajectory of um, really working towards changing history, but not even changing history. I think changing lives, right? Because, like we we know, history is one element of it. You know, and the books always tell the story that they're going to tell, um, no matter how much we push on it. But I think that the lives that you touch are, are really the most powerful um, opportunities to create change. And so 
that's what I enjoy doing. That's what I love to do. I love strategy. I love sustainability, and I love creating impact in in ways that that allow us to really reimagine things. So, all of that to say, I wish maybe like more people knew that. But but aside from that, I'm I'm pretty transparent when it comes to my work. So not much outside of that. Yeah. Show and tell. Okay, cool. I'm waiting for us to be shown. Okay, cool. This is mine. So that's you, yeah. So is Rosa supposed to take a guess at what this is and then I explain it? Well, I guess maybe we'll freestyle. So maybe Rosa take a guess at why this is significant to me and then I'll tell you. Wait, um, I have to tell you why this is important. Or like maybe just guess why it's significant. <laughs> Because you all have gas masks. Oh, well, no. Okay. It's well, pretty yeah. powerful. It's like we're in the streets and we got to fucking wear masks because <laughs> we're in two pandemics right now. <laughs> I love it. Oh, okay. Signing off. No. Okay. So the reason why it's significant is because this was our first night of protesting actually no this this is our first night of a freedom march NYC protest so I actually had gone out the night before and based on what I saw the night before that's why we came back out the next day a lot more organized and coordinated so this is actually May 31st it was the anniversary of the bombing of Black Wall Street yeah. and we organized the first freedom march NYC protest and that was the largest nonviolent protest in New York City to take place that night and that was the night when people said that the KKK was coming to town there were still police shoppers in the air, the narrative around the looting and the rioting was still happening um, and it was taking place throughout different parts of the city. And even in the midst of all that, we still came out anyways and we were compelled to be on the front lines. And that was literally the night that Freedom March NYC was formed. And that's me next to my co-founder and um, Nia White, our lead organizer. And to all the way to the right is Fatima Berry, who is our head of education. So it's definitely a moment of time. And since then, like this picture has been everywhere. It's been like in a Forbes article. Yeah, I've seen it a lot, yeah. Designs. Um, so yeah, it's been everywhere. So that's, that's why I love this picture. And we actually didn't even want to take this picture. That's the crazy thing. Like there was a photographer that was there and was like, let me take a picture of you all. And we're like, oh, we're so tired. No, like we don't want to take a picture. And then we were like, plus, you know, at the time we didn't really trust anybody out there, you know, who you don't, who you didn't come with, you know, you're kind of like, you know, um, skeptical. So it's like, oh, you want a picture of us? What are you going to do with this picture? Like, who are you? You know, um, but we took it anyways. He sent it to us and the rest is history. Yeah, that's a great picture. I have seen it though. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's see yours. You're showing that one. Let's see. Okay, so I'll take a guess at what this is. This is hard because I feel like I wish it was like zoomed in a little bit more because like I'm yeah, it's a little blurry for sure. Um. Okay, so I think that it is. <laughs> funny. I think that it is significant because you are clearly standing on stage, um, a large platform. I'm assuming, or a large audience, and putting up your. This, um, which obviously is a is a symbol of the movement of Black Power, and I don't really know where you are, but, but you're about to tell us, so yeah. But this looks yeah. like we don't. Mind. This was in 2015 in in Montreal, Canada. We were there for a weekend. Um, they call it African Diasporic Weekend. You know, a lot of people don't know how many, um, particularly Caribbean people, they are in in Canada, and. Uh, People don't realize how close we are to the border, like in Albany, I could get to Canada in four hours. Um, but that's my daughter. Um, so she wanted to come up and she said, I want to come and close out your speech with the Asada chant and Black Lives Matter. And that's my daughter um, chanting. It is our you know, duty to fight for freedom and just there doing her thing. Um yeah, that was in 2015. And then she, for a couple years, took a break and was like, I don't want anything to do with anything because everybody, mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, doesn't recognize me just as myself. I'm always your daughter. And then, like, recently, she's become 
really back engaged with the youth here, her crew in Albany, you know? So I didn't even remember this because someone sent it to me like a year later. And I was like, oh my God, that's like my seed. Because, and I chose this too, because most people don't realize that most of us don't grow up in movement households. Like mm -hmm. I know generations of movement people where the dad was an, a freedom fighter and the mom and then the daughter and now they're that child. But I didn't grow up in a movement household, but now my daughter has grown up in a movement household. So yeah. that's Alicia. Yeah, doing her thing. And definitely relevant to the whole intergenerational uh, aspect of this evening. So I definitely yes. that. Yeah. And I've actually been called a bad mother, you know, for having her out. Um, a lot of us who have children her age, like, mm -hmm. how can you have them out and the police and tear gas and everything? It's like, you know, I always say because they kill seven and 12 year olds. So, like, mm -hmm. what would make my daughter different if a cop saw her as a threat, you know? Um, so I've often been like, you know, I never judge anybody to take your kid or don't, but it's interesting that to this day, people see that picture and be like, I can't believe you had your daughter out there. And I'm like, I don't make her do anything she doesn't want to do. Like she does it. She, or sometimes she'll be like, don't come to the protest because everybody's going to want to talk to you. And I'm trying to run this. And I'll be like, all right, you know, but um, a lot of us as, as mothers, like they never say the fathers are bad fathers for letting their kids be in protest. Mm -hmm. You know, whether the father or the other partners in the household, it's always the mom that gets like, you're a bad mother. What's wrong with you? What are you doing? Keep her innocent. I'm like, what innocence are you talking about in America? Mm -hmm. Like, I think I would be doing a disservice to my daughter if I was not telling her the truth and raising her up in a movement family where she has blood family, but she also has like movement family that have seen her grow up too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Personal questions. Let's see. We're going to have to, we're going to have to do the lightning round on these ones. Okay. Okay. We're ready for personal questions. So Chelsea, what do you think will happen after the election? Ooh, that's a great question. I think that after the election, we will continue to still um, fight in a lot of ways what we're currently fighting now, right? I don't think that, and this is also a misconception, like when we're talking about electoral politics and the, the importance of voting, it's not with the understanding that on November 3rd, depending on who's in office, whether it's the Democratic or Republican Party. Um, and if we have a change, right, in administration, that somehow that's going to fix everything because it's not. So for me, it's continuing to do the work after the elections. It's continuing to show up and hold people accountable. It's continuing to pay attention to local elections as well. Because even, you know, like after the election, the election that we're talking about is, is the presidential election. But we know that's not the be all end all election for so many of us when we're talking about who directly makes the decisions on who is the police commissioner, on who is the appointed officials who make decisions about budgets and community boards and police department budgets and allocation of education resources. Um, that happens on a local level. And so for me, it's like after the elections is continuing the conversation and continue the momentum and educating people as much as possible on how they can play active roles in their communities to do the work. Freedom March NYC actually launched our Freedom Fall campaign, which is a digital training on teaching people how to register to vote, organize in your community, and things of that sort. And so I see us continuing to just do that, even, even with the elections, after the elections, mm -hmm. that's all that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, next question, we are ready. Oh, um, my upbringing was not what led me to activism. It was going to college, but my experience was I was born in, in, in the Bronx in 1972. So I was born at a time where the Bronx was basically burnt down. Um, a lot was rubble. Then we had the 1977 blackout as well as hip hop was being formulated. Um, but 
as as the Bronx was continuing to burn and my mom was concerned about our education, we moved to Westchester County. So for those that live in New York State, first and foremost, like New York City is not a state. There's a lot of other places in New York that's not New York City, but the suburbs of Westchester County are only like 21 miles away from the Bronx, but it was like two completely different worlds, right? So it's like the Bronx and then 21 miles later, I lived in this really small town called Elmsford, New York. I went to Alexander Hamilton High School. I graduated with like 35 people. I was a cheerleader. I ran track. I was like in this kind of utopic bubble because everyone in that community was African-American or white. Mm -hmm. And we were the only Latinos at that time, even in that small town. Now the demographic has totally flipped. So I had like this public school experience that was very private school, right? Eight of us in a class, we were all expected to excel. We were all expected to go to college. We were all, ex you know, like our school trips were not to the Bronx Zoo. My school trip was to Spain, Portugal, and Morocco when I was 16, you know? So, um, but my mom always took it back on the weekends to see my family in the Bronx, hang out with my family in the Bronx. And to this day, my father still has his business 51 years later in the Bronx on sound and what people would consider the sound view section of the Bronx, right? So it wasn't the upbringing. I was brought up to be very um, culturally aware of being Puerto Rican, who I was, um, being bilingual and always being around family, especially in Puerto Rico. But it wasn't until I went to college that I began to like ask questions of the history I didn't know about Puerto Rico, why my parents didn't tell me things. Um, I don't even think I knew why I was an American citizen. I just knew I was. Um, so what I would say most of my upbringing is that my parents definitely, no matter what, instilled a very deep, intense love for being Puerto Rican and intense love for family, which at times also led to a lot of not truth telling and not um, being very honest about a lot of things. So, you know, it, um, yeah. Like everything was always good until you go to therapy and you're like, yeah, that wasn't supposed to be like that. But um, it's it's interesting now because I'll have conversations with my dad all the time now because I think I politicized him and my mom's like, stop telling him things. Then he's talking to me too long. You know, just call me randomly and be like, what's happening with this? So it actually brought me and my father really closer together because as I was learning my own history, he was like, he knew what it was, but it was like reading books and really discussing it where he really was like, oh, we're a colony. Like, what does that mean? And we don't have the same rights. We can't vote for the president in Puerto Rico and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Last words. So I would definitely say that this has been a joy of uh, Rosa being able to connect with you and learn more about your activism. I definitely think that there should be more conversations like this when it comes yeah. to um, intergenerational movement building and just kind of like learning right um, about different folks experiences and, and how it connects to the, the larger picture and what we mean when we talk about activism because I think that everyone's activism looks different. Everyone's activism is very much so contingent based on their experiences and, and their identity and their understanding of, of the work and their place in the movement. And so this has been great. And I would definitely say if anyone wants to continue to stay involved in the work that I'm doing or Freedom March NYC is doing, feel free to follow me on Instagram at the Chelsea Miller or at Freedom March NYC on Instagram at Freedom March NYC because we have a lot of incredible, incredible things coming up um, regarding civic engagement, voter mobilization, and also educating folks on what we mean when we talk about protesting and holding our leaders accountable. Yeah, I mean, I love this format. So this is brilliant. Um, for me, the Caribbean Cultural Center has been my home um, for now over 25 years. And I'm just always so grateful for 
Dr. Vega for not only starting this, but maintaining mm -hmm. it <clears throat> for folks who are watching. Um, Dr. Vega and one other woman are the only two black or African descendant um, women that actually have institutions that are brick and mortar and have been around for over 40 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. So what for me, anytime I could be, you know, part of any of the work of the Caribbean Cultural Center, um, African Diaspora Institute, it's always yes and please, because it like I feel no one understands me more than everybody who is um, at the center, whether it's the board or Melody, who's the executive director, and now like Mikey and Kat, and just seeing like the the work that they're doing, Aaliyah and all that all of that. So yeah, I mean, last words, you know, there's never any last words. Like, oh, I wake up tomorrow. But um, I think that we have to come to an understanding that this work requires a lot of sacrifice. And um, there will be a lot of down moments, you know, and <clears throat> because of our age difference, it's like, you're on this high, we're all on this high at a moment and then something like washes it away because something we didn't expect to happen happens or the people we thought had our back didn't or like who was actually your comrade or who doesn't want to see you succeed. Like all those things are real in activism and organizing. Like I've seen the pettiest stuff from organizers and activists, but I've also seen the most revolutionary things from organizers and activists. And I feel at this time, my role is to not only see what young people like you are doing, but also be able to be like, you might want to do that a little different or think about that more. And it takes me to those moments with my elders when I was like, no, I know everything. You're completely wrong. And then like 10 years later, I'm like, I was so right. wrong. I'm like, what? Why did you tell me to stop? You know, <laughs> they're all like, it's not our job to tell you to stop. It's our job to guide you and you'll figure it out on your own that that tactic is not feasible or, or didn't work, you know? <clears throat> so I love the format. I love that we can be together as as Caribbean folks, African descendant women, you know, and I always look at every day as a new opportunity, you know, to do something, to be part of something and sometimes be sad and just stay at home a day and take a break. You know, we're longtime fighters. In fact, <clears throat> Mumia Abu-Jamal calls it a long distance revolutionary. You know, this is definitely not like a sprint. It's a marathon. And you end up seeing people who are clearly aware that their life does not end at 45 or 50, which is what this country kind of, especially as women, this country is like, once you're 40, it's over. Where for me, once I turned 40, I was like, I'm doing whatever I want. I don't care about what people think. I'm gonna have people's back, but I'm also not wasting time with people that don't wanna support me in my vision. Um, or just want to support me when I need it, you know? So, yeah. Well, I see at the bottom it says, thank you for watching. So thank you everyone for watching. Thank you. And, and thank you to the center for, for hosting us this evening. And thank you, Chelsea, for being in the tradition. Um, make sure you text me so I can support your work more. Absolutely. We will definitely connect. Yeah.